Good evening everyone. Here we are at Red Bunker Studios. It's 1 a.m. and this is Red Drama Series. In this episode, we share another odd story from music history. Especially this is the story of Militant, a dreamer and a soccer game gone bad. This is Bob Marley's life and death. We are in 1977 in England. It's springtime and there is a guy, a guy with dreadlocks, which are the kind of hair that looks like a giant spaghetti. A guy about 30 years old with a slosh head colored in red, black, yellow and green. This dude with dreadlocks is playing soccer with his fellas on a dirty soccer field. He's in the act to kick the ball. He makes a mistake. He hits the ground with his right big toe procuring a cut. A big cut. But he doesn't care, it's just a small accident. I mean, who never had an accident playing soccer? Well, this is the first chapter of our story. Let's forget for a moment about dreadlocks, soccer, and the guy with Jamaican slosh hat. Let's go back 30 years ago, in the middle 40s in Jamaica, in a village called Nine Mile, in the district of St. Anne Parish. In Nine Mile lives a white man, originally from Sussex, England, Sir Norval. He's a captain in the Royal Marines, and he is an employer as a plantation overseer. Sometimes he stops by in this village, and so he meets a girl, Sedella. Sedella is 18. She's a black girl, a beautiful black girl. Norval and Sedella fall in love. They marry, have a baby, and Captain Norval supports his family away, traveling from a trip to another, until he dies in 1955 of a heart attack. It seems like we are talking about a love, happy story, novel, but it's not. Here we are talking about real life. The real life in Jamaica in those years. A poor island with many racial issues. The baby born from this couple is Robert Nesta Marley. And when he was left orphaned by his father in 1955, at the age of 10, he had problems with either the black community and the white community because he was mulatto, he was considered a bastard and also because of his height, not so tall, 5 foot 24 to defend himself from those people he had to fight fight with fierceness for this he got the nickname Tough Gong sort of a Jamaican slang for thug living in a slum such as Trenchtown in the 60s for a poor and almost black kid like Robert Nesta Marley was like living in the south of the US in those years, meaning money problems, racial problems, and if you ever wanted to change your life, the only way to stand out was either sport, crime, or music. Robert chooses music. At the age of 14, he quits school and works doing a string of low paid jobs. He could have made a career out of it. For example, in 1966 as a forklift driver at the local Chrysler plant. But he kept working as a forklift driver only to save enough money to properly finance his own record label. Called, guess what, Tough Gong. Becoming a musician and chase his dream to make something huge for people. As Bob likes to say, who's afraid of dreaming is destined to die. Robert Nesta Marley still doesn't have dreadlocks at this part of our second chapter, neither the Tough Gong nickname and Jamaican slosh hat, the one that we will see in many photos, but just starts letting people call him Bob, and for now he's just a boy that plays guitar and sings along with a friend called Neville Bunny Livingston, aka Bunny Wader. Thanks to Bunny that Bob begins listening to a radio tuned on a New Orleans radio station that broadcasts black music. Artists like Ray Charles, Fats Domino, James Brown. Other new musicians joined them. Braveweight Junior, Beverly Kelso, and another one met in a jam session. A rough guy with a nickname even worse than Tough Gong. They call him Stepping Razor, meaning a person that is not to be messed with. Anyway, his real name is Peter McIntosh, shortened by him in Peter Tosh. Bob Marley, Bunny Wader, Peter Tosh, and the other guys from the band the teenagers. Well, that's not a big deal name. In fact, later they changed to Wailing Root Boys and finally to the Wailing Wailers, where his new producer, Sir Coxon, cuts to the Wailers. They start to play a strange kind of music genre, 
because it's characterized by a walking bass line extended with strong rhythms on the offbeat which combine Afro-Caribbean music, American jazz and R&B. It was very popular in Jamaica and from there it will be popular also in England called Ska. The Wailers released their first success single called Simmer Down and soon it became number one single in the charts of Jamaica in February 1964, selling an estimated 70,000 copies. After this initial step, other big steps are going to happen to Bob Marley's life. He marries Rita, a girl from Kingston, met time ago, when Bob became her group's mentor and manager. She gave him three children, and later Bob will have other children, in total 13, two of them adopted from Rita's external relationships, and eight from different women. But the big step that will let him become a militant, a prophet, and will bring us back to our first chapter, and that accident from the guy with dreadlocks, is when he became interested in Rastafari beliefs. Rastafarianism is similar to Christianity, based on interpretation of the Bible, born in Ethiopia, where Haile Selassie I, Ethiopia's old regent and emperor, is believed to be the Messiah descendant from the royal line of David, predicted in the Old Testament and also called Rastafari. Okay, now we're not telling all the story of Rastafarianism and Selassie I. What is that we want to catch here is the philosophy of the movement and what meant Rastafarianism for Bob Marley. First thing, Rastas share a pair of fundamental moral principles, the two great commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. Rastafarianism promotes the idea of living naturally. What Rastas regard as nature's laws, they have a free political vision especially with anti-imperialist and anti-colonist ideas, looking for a world with justice, without poverty, without exploitation, from white people over black people, from rich people over poor people, and racial discrimination from north over south. Bob Marley feels all these injustice and he will bring these feelings into his songs. Second thing, there are some marks that recognize Rasta's movement. One of the dreadlocks, rope-like strands of hair formed by matting or braiding hair can also be formed through a technique called twist and rip and are regarded as a symbol of strength. That's why Rastafarians keep growing their hair into dreadlocks. As Bob Marley sings, keep your culture, don't be afraid of the vulture. Grow your dreadlock, don't be afraid of the wolf pack. Now the second mark is ganja. And as all we know, ganja is marijuana, which is prohibited almost everywhere, even in Jamaica. But for the Rastafarian culture, ganja is not a drug. It's something used for meditation. Rastas often refer to it as the holy herb. So saying let's roll a joint in Rastafarian culture is something right and fair. Bob Marley used to say a few things about it. How could a plant created by God be made illegal by humans? You mean they can tell God that it's not legal? Again, it's something right and fair for Rastafarians, but not for the rest of the world, not even in Jamaica. And even Peter Tosh knows something about it. When during a concert in front of all the Jamaican government members, Tosh sang a song, Legalize It, with a spliff in his hand, lecturing about legalizing cannabis. Because of this, time later, he was arrested and beaten severely while in police custody, and almost slipped away. Last mark is music. Music is important, and like in all religions, it's used to pray, meditate, spread precepts and political concepts. This kind of music that Rasta share is a music that has the same root of ska, called reggae. In 1973, the Wailers released their first album, Catch a Fire. The album's supporting concert tour throughout England and the United States, establishing the band as international stars. They start supporting some famous bands, but after a while, nobody wants them to be supporters, because they are more acclaimed. It was followed later that year by the album Burning, which includes songs like I Shot the Sheriff, Get Up, Stand Up, and Small Axe. And to contribute to their fame is Eric Clapton, that was suitably impressed by Burning to choose to record a cover version of I Shot the Sheriff, where both the versions will peak at number one on Billboard Hot Charts. A year later, as soon as they reached their success, the Wailers broke up. This is an arcane situation that is common for a lot of bands, where they pass hard times, finally reach success, and after they give up and see ya. 
Every Man For Its Way. So it happened to Peter Tosh, Bunny Livingston and Bob Marley, where they set up their own bands. We are in 1974, the year of the breakup. For Bob, it's not a big issue to start from scratch, because he will found Bob Marley and the Waders, releasing the single No Woman No Cry, putting his name on the world top charts again, and will finally put reggae as a popular phenomenon such as rock. Bob Marley used to say, who's afraid of dreaming is destined to die. In Marley's dreams, there is music, but he's also Rastafarian, so he dreams a world full with peace and freedom. For Bob and Rastafarians, freedom is everything. He also used to say, better to die fighting for freedom than be a prisoner all the days of your life. He quotes this concept of freedom in his songs, like Redemption Song and Revolution, and bring this dream in his concerts, two of them in particular. One is in 1976, as known as Smile Jamaica Concert, set up during the election period. There is a sort of civil war between the governmental party and the opposition party. As we said, in those years, Jamaica is a violent nation. It's the third most violent nation after Colombia and South Africa. In fact, in 2005, it still has one of the higher murder rate, which set the world record of 1,674 murders that year, like 58 deaths for 100,000 people in proportion. Anyway, two days before the concert, a group of armed men enter in Bob Marley's house and starts shooting, wounding him, his producer and his wife. But Bob Marley doesn't surrender, and even with a wound in his arm and chest, he succeeds to sing. The second concert is in 1978, organized by Bob himself, calling it One Love Peace Concert. This is the concert where Peter Tosh lights a joint, and at the end, Bob Marley manages to bring up the stage the two party leaders and let them shake their hands while people take photo of them. This is the story of a prophet, a soccer game went wrong and a dream. As we said before in the beginning of our story, and now we're reaching it. Here, Robert Nesta Marley, Tough Gong, the little angry guy, now in this part of our story has become the man in dreadlocks with that colored wool tam while playing soccer in England. He becomes a prophet, a man who is called at the United Nations where he receives a medal for peace, a man who is awarded with the Jamaican Order of Merit, which is the third highest national honor. And most of all, is the one invited in Zimbabwe to be there for their independence party just obtained. He's Bob Marley, the prophet, the hero of the third world. He's the same one of Babylon by Bus and Could You Be Loved, top ranking hits. The same who makes sold out on all of his concerts. But what about that soccer game went wrong? What matters with Bob Marley's life and what matters with his death? Okay, we all know the urban legend where Bob Marley's death was caused by this cut on his toe due by hitting his foot on the ground and got an infection, but it's not true. However, this episode, this accident has influenced the entire life of Bob Marley. It's 1980 and Bob Marley is in New York for a couple of shows at Madison Square Garden. It's September and during a morning jogging tour in Central Park, Bob collapsed and was brought to hospital. What happened? Maybe he's tired, too much stress for the shows, or maybe too much ganja, but hard to believe. None of them. In Bob's mind, it's clear what is happening. Something is wrong, and doctors told him to immediately cancel the US tour and take care of himself. But despite that, two days after this health issue, he flew to Pittsburgh to perform one final performance. It's September 23, 1980, the last concert of Bob Marley. The day after the show, he moved on a plane and flew right to Germany at the Bavarian clinic of Joseph Eisels in Monaco. He visits him, and it's clear he confirmed the diagnosis before diagnosticated. This is cancer, and it spread it on his lungs and brain, and all comes from his foot. Yes, because when he had that accident in 1977, he was visited and was diagnosticated a melanoma under his right toenail. It was diagnosticated in time. He could get away with it, an amputee of the big toe to stop the cancer from spreading, but he refuses because of his rustless belief. The body must be whole, and he was worried that the operation would affect his performing career. So he chooses the second option. He allowed the famous orthopedic surgeon, Dr. William, to do a surgical excision to cut away cancerous tissue on the toe and do a skin graft. But I mean, a cancer is a cancer. You can't get away with simply excision. So what happened is that the cancer spread it on all his vital organs. 
Bob stays in Dr. Isel's clinic where he received an alternative cancer treatment called Isel's treatment, partly based on avoidance of certain foods, drinks, and other substances. While in Germany, Bob Marley celebrated his 36th birthday, and after fighting the cancer without success for eight months, on May 11, 1981, Marley boarded a plane for his home in Jamaica. Unfortunately, he never will reach Jamaica alive again. While flying home, his vital functions worsened, so they were forced to land in Miami, where he was taken at Sedaras of Lebanon Hospital for immediate medical attention. But there he will die. It's a Monday morning of May 11, 1981. His final words to his son Ziggy were money can't buy life. They bury him in his birthplace, Nine Mile, receiving a state funeral. Later, February 6 will become National Celebrating Day, where free concerts with mostly reggae music are played all over Jamaica. In his grave, on top of his heavy bronze coffin, they will play some things. His guitar, his red Gibson Les Paul, a Bible, his ring that he always wore that had been given to him by the Ethiopia Emperor's son. Naturally, a stock of ganja, placed there by his widow Rita and a soccer ball. As happens to all the greatest music gods, no one really dies if they live in the hearts of those who remain. Bob Marley used to say a thing. He used to say, my music will go on forever. Maybe it's a fool say that. But when me know facts, me can say facts. My music will go on forever. <laughs>